Thank you for choosing CTN. And now, it's time with Herman and Sharon. Trouble selling you. <laughs> Hello there. How are you? Hi, everybody. We have a young lady with us. Very attractive young lady. You thought I was talking it. about you, didn't you? No. It's true. No. Uh, <laughs> Christine. Schneeringer. Schneeringer. Did I say that? Did she you say you that? nailed it. You're great. Is the executive director of Worthy Creations in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Very pretty place. Yes. Uh, which is a parachurch ministry specializing in sexual redemption. She is a freelance writer, speaker, comedian. Her articles have appeared in Decision Magazine, Charisma, Christian Single, and Leading Adults. Uh, uh, Christine received her master's degree, get, get this, she's not only pretty but very smart, in counseling psychology at Palm Beach Atlantic University. She began doing comedy three years ago, being mentored by, uh, I've, I've had her on, Chanda Pierce, remember mm -hmm, her? Mm -hmm. She broke me up. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this fall, she is touring with Chanda Pierce, sharing her testimony through stand-up comedy. comedy yeah. So, so did you, I mean, just discover one day, I can make people laugh. I'm, I, did it just happen? It's interesting that I didn't know I was funny. I would just be sharing my testimony, and because I have been in ministry for 16 years, and I would share my testimony at churches or Sunday school or any kind of event, and people would laugh at certain parts, and I would go, oh, okay, I didn't know that was funny. I would just be sharing my story, and people <laughs> right. would laugh. And then a friend from church who does homeschool drama ministry, she really challenged me and said, you should go take a class, you should try comedy. and. And people had said before, you should be a comedian, but I was like, I don't know how people do that. Like, I don't really know how that works. And so when this lady who is very much involved in the, you know, entertainment and, and theater and performing arts said it, it, it had more weight. And so eventually I tried it in a leadership development course of all places. I tried stand-up comedy. And, and then another comedian reached out to me to mentor me, a guy named Michael Jr., was uh, mentored me for my first year in doing comedy. So I've been learning how to share my story, packaged in comedy. Share your story. Okay. Well, um, I come out of a gay background, so we'll just start with there. You know, I dropped, how long? How long was I gay? About six years. Not a long time because God intervened at an early age, which I'm grateful for because yeah. I know many people who have walked in that, those shoes for decades before. They said, you know what, I don't, I don't want this in my life. I, I, want, I want God's best for me, and I know this isn't it, and I'm settling. But for me, he intervened at an early age, which I'm grateful, and it was through, of all places, playing softball with Baptists. <laughs> that was how I got evangelized over wow. in Tampa at Ida Baptist that. Church. <laughs> yeah, I love sports, and so that's what yeah. got me there. But it got me around Christian, Christians on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And through that, and I didn't know they were praying for me. So it was basically a divine conspiracy. So, what was your best sport? <laughs> Tennis. And I think it is the best sport anyway. So It is. It is. I it's, love it. It's I had to stop though, it was tearing up my hips. Oh, okay. A guy my age, you know. I love, love, love tennis. But so I come also from a history of sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. And there was just You mean family members or your your immediate family? Um, you know, there was more than one abuser and so I'd have, you know, um Did that create the lifestyle, I mean, was that a push for that lifestyle? Well, I think sexual abuse, I mean, a lot of straight men and women who have been, have been sexually abused, so it doesn't make somebody gay, so let's be clear on that. But I think when we are sexually abused, it will set us up, maybe we'd be at higher risk to become homosexual or lots of other things as well, promiscuity, for example. So it does create, you know, issues, and, um, and so, yeah, that was a factor in my life, and there was also, domestic violence in my home, my parents didn't get along, my dad was abusive to my mom, and all these things were a factor because they, they, what they did was they impacted how I viewed my gender and how I viewed the opposite sex. So I didn't have a high view of men because I, they didn't seem safe to me. Right. And... Did you, did you have an attraction for same sex? I mean, like, you know, a guy looks at a pretty girl and mm -hmm. he goes, you know, he just, he goes, 
like this. He notices and he turns it, right? Back. And he turns back. Right. Did is, is that from is, a young age? I I had a hunger for feminine love. At the time, as I was younger, I, it wasn't sexualized yet until I hit puberty, and then it became sexualized. And I believe that hunger for feminine love was really something that it was uh, a misplaced need, because I think we all need same-sex bonding and affection. We need that, and when you don't get that, sometimes that need will get exaggerated, and that's what happened in my own case. And, but I'm just, you know, I want to say I'm really glad I was a child of the 70s, because really? I grew up hating my gender. And if I grew up in this day and age hating my gender, I believe I would be encouraged to go down a path towards transgender, of trying to change my gender. Yeah. And you really can't change your gender. It's plastic surgery is what we're doing, but it's, you can't really change your DNA. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a form of deception. And for me, I've thought about it, because I, I, I enjoy being a woman today. But for many years, I hated my gender, because I, I had a, a perception from growing up in my home where my mother was abused by my dad, I believed that to be feminine was to be weak. And so I didn't want to be like my mother and I didn't want to be a victim. I identified femininity with victimhood. And so I gravitated toward masculinity out of a desire to protect myself. Wow. And I didn't understand any of and that. You know, I just knew I hate, I hate being a girl. And being good at sports. Yeah, that probably didn't help yeah. in terms of my gender identity. So yeah. I, that really never formed growing up. And, but today I love being a woman. So I was reflecting on that recently because culture talks so much about gender these days and it's almost like it's an option. Like, which gender do you want to be? I know, I know. Yeah. And, <laughs> and for me, I didn't go down a road of trying to change my gender. What I changed was my mindset. I changed how I felt about my gender. Mm -hmm. And culture says, well, if you don't like your gender, you can change it. But I think uh, it's more appropriate to look at your mindset. We, we had a... I was just talking to Christine in the green room. When we finished a program a few months ago, we got to talking after the cameras were off. Remember that time? Yes. And, and I mean, we got into a <laughs> two subject. I said, man, I'd give anything for the cameras to have stayed on. We talked, I remember we talked about yeah. when I was a young adult and I was in a, yes. in a Bible cult. Yes. Can you go there and just kind of pick up yes. where we left off? I, and I don't, I don't share that often just because it's like hard to follow because it's already dramatic enough to say I came out of yeah. a gay background. Yeah. But when I was in college, I get involved in what I thought was a church. Now do me a favor. Don't, don't apologize for anything you're about to say. Okay. Okay, because when the camera's on, that goes on. When the cameras are off, you never apologize for anything. You just let it go. <laughs> okay. So don't go there. Okay. So just let it go. No, thank you for that. Um, I, yeah, when I was in college, I got involved with a church that was really not a church. It was much more destructive than that. And it was, later I realized it was a cult. And it, it's embarrassing to admit that. They preached the Bible? They preached the Bible, but it was, there's certain things about it, uh, very, very controlling. We all lived together in a house in the suburbs of Tampa, Florida. I mean, we actually were in the news for a while. There was articles about us. Yeah. And it was actually the one time in my life, because when the, the media was reporting about us, this is in 1988, when the media was reporting about us, it was the one time in my life I can say the media was on my side. Because they were trying to expose this group. Because it wasn't, it wasn't a good group. Um, in terms of just being, it was, you know, it was just a fringe group where one guy had all this power and had a group of followers and he was trying to grow this group of followers. It was I Jim mean, Jones' life. Oh, gosh. But what yes. attracted you to that type of a church? You know though? what's interesting? Well, okay, so uh, a friend got involved and, well, it actually was an ex-lover. I mean, I was going to try to go around that, but it wasn't. Yeah, so you just let it go. I do. Okay. I had to just, let it go. Just let it go. <laughs> so anyway, so my, my lover at the time, my lesbian lover, came back from our first year of college and said, I want to start going to church. And I was like, okay. Like, I was like, I just, I didn't know what to say to that. You're like, all right, if you want to go to church, go to, I was like, I don't want to go to church. <laughs> and so, um, and so she, so, and we were uh, college athletes. We were on scholarship at, at, at a junior college playing tennis. And our coach was this, we had a new coach that year and she was a Christian and very vocal about her faith. And so I was like, well, you're going to like coach, you know, she's all about Jesus, you know. And so my, 
my friend, my girlfriend, she gets involved in this church and started to get me involved. And and one of the reasons I got involved was... Now, can I ask you? Yes. Remember where you are. Yes. Okay. When you're homosexual. Yes. Or lesbian. Yes. Do you have the same desire like heterosexuals that says, you know, I want to get a in. sex drive. Let's be clear, okay. everybody. I but, mean, we're but, all sexual beings. Okay, I'm not going there. Okay. I mean, do you have okay. the same Sorry. desire? <laughs> do you have the same desire to say, you know, I want to get into a good church. I want to, I want to associate well, I with. I can't speak for all gays. But, but so that they have the same kind of. Well, th think about that. We're all sexual beings. Yeah. We're all spiritual beings. Okay. Now, whether we want to, and people, people pursue spirituality without pursuing the God that we would say we serve, the God of the Bible, a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Like people can still say I'm spiritual, but I don't follow that God, but that's the God that I follow. Okay. She was brought up in a Christian home and wanted to return to those roots. Okay. Okay. That was where All that right. came okay. from. And as yeah. far as she was concerned, you and her, your relationship was okay with this. We never discussed that, so we were just in a, we were lovers. I mean, we never said, what do you think God thinks of our relationship? And I okay. think that happens a lot of times to people. They might get involved in a relationship and not really be thinking, oh, I don't know if this is good or bad, right or wrong. It just, it just happened. And so for us, it just happened and we went with it because I think we were meeting a need in each other's lives. Now, I'm not going to say it was appropriate to do it that way because it's outside God's boundaries. Did you ever wake up and say, I just can't do this anymore? I mean, were you ever convicted? I was convicted later when I was in a relationship with a married woman. I was convicted because she was married. Okay. So, but I was not convicted about my homosexuality. So that never did anything. Well, and it's in your interesting. Thinking. Well, so this this church that we got into that uh, was so not helpful. One of the things I feel like because the, the when they approached me, it was like um, homosexuality is wrong. You need Jesus. Okay, which I agree with that, right? But at the time, they weren't very helpful because they took a pr an approach which. And this is an approach that I think the media likes to spin on people like me who are formerly homosexual. They like to say, in fact, I was on CNN a couple years ago and underneath, you know, they had the little, the little graphic yeah. underneath yeah. and it said, pray the gay away. And I didn't know because I was on, in studio, so I didn't know what was going underneath my face. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't, I don't actually believe in pray the gay away. But I would say back then, 20 something years ago when I was in this little group that was a fringe group, that would be the approach that they had to homosexuality. And that was the premise how they got us involved so in this that, church. So was, did they looked like it was a demon? They had to cast the demon out of you? It was just a very legalistic group, very controlling. People gave 100% of their income. They were expected to do that. It was, it was very, very controlling. And that's why the school... Was the patch, pastor touchy-feely? He was. So he got... So it was inappropriate. It, it was never became overtly sexual, but once we got out of this group, and in fact, I mean, we couldn't even get alone. Uh, my, my, my girlfriend's parents came to visit her because they were very concerned about this group once the media started reporting on it, and she, she wasn't allowed to be alone with her parents. Wow. Because wow. the pastor was like... You know that's a cult. Thing. Yes. The pastor yeah. was like, oh, they're trying to interfere with your relationship with God. Mm-hmm. And we don't want anything to interfere with that. And so they, you know what they did? They had their daughter kidnapped. They paid a lot of money for people to kidnap their daughter. And then another set of parents came in and did the same thing because these, we were already like so far gone. So in other words, the, the person that was actually there did not want to leave. Right, because, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a whole dynamic of like the, going along with the crowd, you know, going along with what everybody else believes. And you're looking on at everybody else in the same church and thinking they're very spiritual. And I was thinking they're very spiritual and I want to be like them. But they were all had questions that I, I had the same, I had questions in my mind about what was happening. And they but, did too. Yeah, but we weren't allowed to say anything negative. Yeah. So we couldn't ask questions. I remember one time we were reading the Bible. We were only allowed to use the King James version of the Bible. And so we're doing a Bible study and he shared a scripture and then I was reading the context of the scripture and I got called out in church for like, hey, 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 I'm over here, I'm talking. You're not supposed to be reading while I'm talking. And I was just looking at the context. So you can make the Bible say anything you want if you isolate the text. That's right. And so 
it, it was that trying go, to... That goes on on Christian television. Yeah, and it, so they were trying to pray the gay away. That wasn't helpful for yeah. me, so I want to go on record saying I don't believe in pray the gay away because homosexuality isn't just a spiritual issue. Yes, homosexuality is sin, but you know what? There's lo all kinds of things that are sin, so I don't want to single it out as if it's a sin worse than other sins because right. there's many, many behaviors that fall short of God's standard. Gossip right? is one. Absolutely, yeah. overeating, yeah. Mm -hmm. which I struggle with at times. And so, um, we weren't getting to the root of the problem, and it wasn't until years later that I was able to get to the root of the problem because it's also a relational issue, and I have found that's healed in the context of right relationships. One thing is my relationship started with being emotionally dependent, where I would get connected to a woman and emotionally over-attach on her. And that's a form of relationship idolatry. Mm -hmm. It's idolatry when you have one person in your life and you're looking for them to meet all of your needs for security, for well-being, for affirmation, that if this person's not happy with me, that I can't be okay. Yeah, that's right. It's like, it's in a form of enmeshment. Do, do relationships like you have, do they find somebody that they want more than you? Is this just like heterosexual? It's like, okay, you know, I, I, th I think I like her better than you. See ya. I mean, sure, so people, that can happen. Because, I mean, you, you broke up with, with one, right? You, well, and then you got a relationship. being in that little church thing broke it up for us, you know. So you, you, you weren't? And so I got out of that, but I'll tell you my big takeaway from, from being in that group for a while. Yeah. I said, this is what I get for trying to be something I am not. I am a gay woman. And to be anything else gets me in trouble. So I went back into homosexuality. So it wasn't until later, and this is what I shared in the last time I was here, playing softball with Baptists. And that was just my love of sports that got me there because I was done with God and done with church. I had seen enough bad examples of Christian leaders, like this pastor for one. And But even in my home as a girl, my father became a Christian in the 70s and he was abusing my mother and he continued to physically and verbally abuse my mother. He was abusing alcohol and pornography. So his behavior didn't change, but he claimed the name of Christ. Mm -hmm. Went and to so church? That, yes, yeah. and so that, 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 was, that was very confusing to me wow. about God because I'm like, if God's okay with you hitting your, your wife, I don't really think I like God because God is not pro-women and I think God is pro-women. I think Jesus did more for women than yeah. anybody yeah, ever did, yeah. he did in affirming and esteeming women. Mm -hmm. That's right. So my dad was misrepresenting the character of God. So years later when I met this man who was supposed to be a pastor, he was exploiting my need for a father. And I was vulnerable because of that. So when I got out of that situation, I was like, I was done with God. And so the only, so God, he came at me a different way. And he used my love of sports to get me on, around Christians on a regular basis. He had chosen you and you weren't gonna he get away. Came after me. He <laughs> yes, goes he looking did. for lost sheep. Yeah. That's and right. so he prevailed upon me with his love. Yeah. And then I, I was smitten by him. I mean, because it's when you get to taste his love and I tasted it through people mm -hmm. and through their kindness and their generosity. And they were praying for me also because they could tell I, I still looked the part. I was still very, very masculine. I still hated my gender. Mm -hmm. And so when I became a Christian, then I get to reckon with my sin nature and my particular sin at that season of my life, homosexuality, and get to deal with that and get to allow God into that part of my life. And so it was a process. It wasn't pray the gay away. Now, it doesn't mean God can't do that, but I've seen over and over where, where we have to work through our issues. It's, that, not, that it's not some kind of magic fix. I wish That's it right. was, you know, a little rabbit's foot, you know, thing. <laughs> you rub it and you know, everything's well. But... I think it, God gets glory in the process. Mm -hmm. And I think we get to know him in the process. And so he doesn't want to shortchange that. And, and I think, you know, uh, by the, the process keeps me dependent on him because if he zapped us all into everything we wanted to be, I don't know that we would serve him like we do when we know that we need him. In that right. athletic group, yes. uh, who approached you and wanted to share that you needed a relationship with Christ? Was it? You know what's interesting? Nobody from that church or from that softball team, Christian softball team that I was playing on when I was gay. You said it was Idlewild Baptist, Baptist, Baptist church. church. Nobody approached me about my homosexuality or Jesus. And they were a little uncomfortable with me because I was, I didn't play ball like a Christian, if that <laughs> makes sense. I was 
so they were a little bit like nervous because yeah. I was you wanted to win I did and <laughs> that right. wasn't that was secondary to them but it was yeah. primary to me yeah and so I stood out because I was throwing my glove on the field and cussing on the field and they were like oh my soul <laughs> but but you know what they did is they prayed for me so they they didn't approach me they prayed for me that's they laid the groundwork of the prayer if anybody if, if people don't hear anything I want to say that pray Galatians 6 9 let us not grow weary in well-doing for in due season you shall reap if you faint not so it's like they they lay that groundwork in prayer and over time that's the other thing yeah it's not up for them to be my convictor you know they're not the Holy Spirit but in time I wanted what they had I wanted the love that they showed me I wanted to be like them because they were just a loving beautiful wonderful people and I wish that the world today would look on at Christians and go I want what they have they're that's a right. loving wonderful group of people and I want to be like that and I want people like that in my life I don't think that's the I don't think that's our reputation no. in no, the culture I think we're known more for what we're against than what we're for mm -hmm. but Jesus was pro people he loved people yeah, yeah that's right. when Jesus was on the earth they called him a friend of sinners you know what they meant that as an insult you friend of sinners like as if it was bad yeah. he but was they, talking to the woman at the well the Pharisees that's what they said about him you're a friend of sinners but where else do you want sinners than to be in the presence of Jesus because yeah. how are they ever going to get to know the loving character of God except that they are in the presence of Jesus and we are we represent him now we're Jesus with skin on and so thankfully at that season of my life it was going down the way that it was a very healthy representation of God for the very first time in my life. It was healthy. And so... When did the change take place? Well, it, I became a Christian, and then, then I, was, I was challenged by what the Bible says about homosexuality. It's, it's, homosexuality is condemned in the Old and the New Testament. There's no getting around that. Some people like to say, well, Jesus didn't mention it, so it must be okay. It's like, well, there's some other things Jesus didn't mention that we wouldn't say, oh, that's okay. Like Jesus didn't mention sexually abusing children. We wouldn't go, oh, that it must be okay since he didn't talk about it. We'd go, oh no, that's, that's wrong. So we have to look at the logic. And for me, it was a process of repenting, changing my mind, changing my attitude, saying, okay, God, one thing I had to repent of is hating my gender. Mm -hmm. And saying, okay, you made me a woman. I may not like it, but I'm gonna go with it because you're God and I'm not. So I'm gonna go with it. And I don't understand it and I think you made a mistake and I think I would have been a much better man, but I'm gonna go with it. So it was an act of obedience and then the feelings followed and it didn't necessarily happen immediately, but over time as I began to move forward in a direction of saying, you're God, I'm not, I trust you. Did you start dressing different? You know, it's so funny. I didn't have decent clothes for church. I would borrow my sister's clothes to wear to church because Idlewild, you know, back then it was people were usually a little more dressed up for church. Now people wear jeans and yeah. stuff, but I wore her dresses and skirts to church because I was trying to fit in and and people would say, oh, you look so nice. Yeah. And I would say, it's not mine, because I felt like I couldn't take credit. <laughs> this is not my outfit. But it was just me saying, okay, I'm a girl, and I'm going to dress like a girl. Yeah. I'm going to do the things girls do. And over time, and it's interesting, and so then I found out about the work of Exodus because I heard Cy Rogers on Christian radio sharing his testimony. And I was filled with hope that if God could help him, God could help me with my journey out of homosexuality. And so I, so I began to get help for this issue, attend a support group, and talk to people who had walked down this road. That's why I'm so excited to get to talk about it, because there's people who feel trapped by their homosexual feelings. Now, you're, you called yourself Chris, right? Well, yes, and I was getting ready to say, I was at a conference where they talked about how to develop a secure gender identity, and that was a big thing in my life, because I was this masculine girl. Yeah. And I only went by Chris throughout my whole life because I hated my name because it was so obviously feminine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Christine. So I wouldn't let you call me that. And, and another form of repentance of saying, okay, you're God, I'm not. And I was shortening my name because I was trying to masculinize it. Chris there, could be a guy there, or a girl. So I went right. by Chris. Yeah. It's interesting though. As a, So I came home from that conference and I, I told everybody, please call me Christine from now on. And so I went by Christine and I realized though, and, and, and just that graphic illustrates it. I was stopping short of the cross and going by Chris. Yeah, it's the key. Yeah. Yes. yes. And we can't stop short of the cross. Wow. And so I began That's to amazing. embrace not only my name, 
but my identity as a woman. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I feel comfortable in my skin as a woman. And you know, that's biblical. The Bible talks about renewing our mind. Yeah. It's not about just change your de gender, yeah. change your mindset. Yeah. That's right. That camera is yours, Christine. <laughs> Share Christ with somebody. They don't even know why they tuned in. They can't believe what's, they were just flipping. what has been That's said. Right. Flipping channels. And, and they were ready to move on, and they can't move on. Mm -hmm. Share why they can't move on. Well, what happened for me is God intervened with his love. I was introduced to his redeeming love, and I tasted something I'd never tasted before. I was settling for the counterfeit. And I was also going against what he had for me and embracing who he made me to be. And so I've learned to renew my mind so that I can prove the acceptable, good, and perfect will of God. And so his will for me is perfect. And it was that I would be a woman. I'd be comfortable as a woman. And you can be comfortable in your gender. You can be comfortable in knowing that he loves you. He has a plan for you. His heart is for you and not against you. And if, if people have m misrepresented God, I want you to know there's a God who loves you unconditionally. And again, his heart is for you. The Bible says that if God is for you, who could be against you? So I want to encourage you to seek that love out and not settle for a counterfeit love. Pray with somebody right now. So Lord, we pray right now. I pray for anyone who's listening, Amen. who is questioning their sexuality, even their gender, mm -hmm. who's questioning whether you're real, whether you really do love them, because sometimes when we get involved in things like I got involved in, and, or when we're sexually abused and we're defiled, we're questioning your love for us. How could you love us and let these things happen? And God, I ask, Lord, that, that, that your love would transcend all of those questions. I ask that you show up in their lives. To me, you did it through a church softball team. You can do it in any way you see fit, God, but I do ask that you would pursue with your unrelenting love, like the prodigal, the father of the prodigal son who ran toward the repentant sinner. God, I just ask that you would run to those that are questioning and seeking. And Lord, I just pray for your Holy Spirit to guide them to know that you're real and that you want to offer life and life abundant. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Mm -hmm. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> and thou shalt be saved. Mm -hmm. How do you believe? So simple. Just ask him to forgive you cleanse me. I give you my life today. I receive you today. He will transform your life. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching It's Time. If you have recently made a decision for Christ, Herman and Sharon would like to hear from you.